I have to tell you, I <coughs> was excited about the music this morning because I had, a, I had this message to teach last week and then I realized it was Mother's Day and so God dropped another one on me and so I pondered this message for two weeks and uh, I went, God, I know how you like to do this. I'm not going to tell Randy what to play. I had a couple of songs in mind that I wanted her to play and she played both of them. <laughs> And I love how that happens. Um, some of you may be wondering why I'm sitting on the chair like this. I wanted to, today's more like a talk. It's not as much preaching. Uh, but the other thing is, when I sit like this, I'm reminded what it feels like to sit on my motorcycle. <laughs> and I like I like that. So I thought, what better way to teach, right? So anyway, if it had a couple of bars up here, we'd be perfect. Anyway, anyway, um, so uh, this morning, the message is going to be about suffering. And uh, one of the reasons I feel like this is pertinent to talk about is because Americans don't suffer well. And 90% uh, of the rest of the world suffers all the time. And... Um, we need to understand that that's as much a part, believe it or not, as, as the way God uses us, as it is with praise, as it is with um, healing, as it is with um, God flowing through a person. Um, now I'm going to preface this with my suffering in this whole cancer journey is nothing compared to 90% of the people I know who have different varieties of cancer and or all different things. I don't see, I don't even see what I'm going through on some levels as much suffering yet. There's enough there that when I read Job, I get it. When I read Jeremiah, I get it. When I, when I read Paul, I get him. So there's enough there that I get it. And uh, on some levels, if, if you're in something in your life and you don't know what to do with it, uh, and you're a follower of Jesus, let me tell you, you need to have your eyes wide open because he's trying to teach us something, right? And so that's what this morning is about. Um, I want you to be encouraged, though, because a lot of great saints, I, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but there's a group of people in heaven that are dressed in white and they're standing. Everybody else is sitting at the table, but they're standing. It's because those are people that suffered for Jesus and for whatever reason, he ranks them higher in heaven. And we need to, we need to chew into that. You want to talk about something that's hard to wrap your head around those people are on a whole different level in heaven there are different levels in heaven and we see it all the time when you study it but yeah when you see the martyrs when you see the people that have given their life for christ they're they're standing in heaven all right that's that's a big deal and so uh, as we look at the hall of faith again today every one of these messages that I'm doing here lately of coming out of Hebrews chapter 11 and the reason is because he mentions about 25 people that all had struggles and in these struggles they rose above and they became something that only God could get the glory for um, so once again I'm gonna point out one of those uh, chapter 11 verse 22 it was by faith that Joseph when he was about to die, said confidently that the people of Israel would leave Egypt. He even commanded them to take his bones with them when they left. I want you to think about that for a minute. That's, that's having faith beyond even understanding. 
can you imagine saying, listen, I'm, I'm about 85, I'm about 90 years old. That's about how old Joseph was when he died. I have did what I'm supposed to do. As Paul says, I've run the race, I've finished the course. But when you guys leave, take my bones with you. Now, here's a fascinating thing. I don't think they literally went and dug up his bones and, and went, okay, here's the femur and here's the knee. You know, they didn't do that. What's fascinating is, is you know who Joseph is? He's the second in charge of Egypt. I mean, there's Egyptian writings about Joseph. Joseph was mummified. Joseph was treated as an Egyptian. So they took a sarcophagus with them. Hmm. Think about that. They literally took one of those things we see in a museum, only it was Joseph's bones in there. And it still has skin on it and everything. When you really stop and think about who Joseph is, he's a character that is treated almost like a god on earth. Amen. Now I'm going to tell you the story of Joseph because I want, I want you to kind of get into this. Joseph is this character in the Bible that starts out, he's 11th child of uh, Jacob the guy who's going to be called Israel. He's the 11th child. He's born through Rachel, which was Jacob's favorite wife. And that, that's the problem with having multiple wives. You should never have a favorite. <laughs> All right? And so when you, when, when you study these guys that have multiple wives, I'm like, dude, that's idiotic. You don't, you don't want to do that. Anyway... And that goes to show you, too, women, if you ever decide you think you want a second husband, don't do it. All right? Because if you get a favorite, there's going to be fist fights all the time. All right. So get that right off the table. So 11th son, Jacob loved this child more than all the others because he is the firstborn of Rachel who is his favorite wife, and he makes Joseph a coat. And this coat is beautiful. It's made of goat skin, but it's multiple colored. It's even dyed to where when you see him coming, he looks like a rainbow. He literally is fascinating to watch him probably come, right? Well, his brothers hated him and were jealous of him. Number one, because he was born of the favorite wife. Number two, because he's the favorite son. And Jacob didn't let him go keep the sheep like everybody else. Well, guess what? Joseph, by the time he's about 12 or 13, starts having visions. And the only problem with having visions is, is you don't tell them to people who don't understand. So he started having visions of his other 10 brothers bowing down to him. <laughs> and he told them about it. That's a bad idea when they hate you. And so he told them about it constantly. Well, one day, they see him coming. Dad sends a little wine and cheese out to the boys and says, Joseph, take this out and check on my boys. I want to see how my sheep are doing and all that stuff. And they see him coming. And they go, oh, here we go. I'm about sick of that coat of many colors. I'm about sick of this guy telling us we're going to bow down to him someday, blah, blah, blah. And one of them said, you know what, let's just kill him. Let's kill him and let's take his jacket back to dad. We know dad's going to be upset, but we get this guy out of our hair. Well, one of them, and I think this is fascinating, one of them's name was Judah, the lion of the tribe of Judah. You know, Jesus is of that lineage and Jesus does what? He takes the place of us sinners, right? Well, Judas stepped up and said, no, we don't need to kill him. I want you to see that. It's a picture of Jesus. I'll stand in his place. Kill me if you're going to kill somebody. Right? Judas says, no, let's just throw him in a pit. There's this old cistern. And for those of you who are old enough, the cistern was a water and hole kind of thing. People would dig them back in the day. They used to have them all over here. Even one on your property, right, David? And sometimes they're a well, sometimes they're just a hole that holds water because you dig enough down in the clay and it'll hold water. 
and they would dump good water in there or it would hold water as it would seep in and this one was dry and so Joseph come up they grabbed him they threw him in this pit in the ground and then contemplated what they were going to do they got they killed a sheep they put blood on his coat and one of them sent the coat back to his daddy said your son's dead in the meantime here come these Ishmaelites isn't that ironic we know Ishmael is not the favored child right we know that he's at war with everybody around him the Ishmaelites come by and they say well instead of killing him we can make a little money off our brother so they sold him into slavery Joseph at this point is not thinking his vision is going to come true at all in fact it's a hard road to suffering he gets bought by a guy named Potiphar when he comes in this town in Babylon and when he comes into this town and Potiphar buys him Potiphar realizes this guy is sharp he can manage a household because Potiphar was a rich guy and one day Potiphar's wife thought man that Joseph boy is good looking and my my husband doesn't look at me much so she attempts to have a relationship with him physically Joseph runs away naked because he's literally trying to get out of her grasp the problem is that makes him look very guilty of her accusing him of rape so he ends up in prison he ends up in prison for 20 years now what happened to that vision what happened to that vision while he's in the prison the jailer realizes this guy's a great manager so he puts him in charge of the prison while he's in there Pharaoh because this is I said Babylon a while ago I said that wrong he went to Egypt the Ishmaelites ended up in Egypt and so what happens was is two guys end up in prison the baker and the cupbearer to Pharaoh himself and these guys start having dreams and as they have dreams guess what Joseph interprets those dreams and one of them he says look I hate to tell you this but you're going to die when you get back and the other one he says he's going to promote you unbelievably so what happens they both get out of jail nearly the same day both of them forgot all about Joseph forgot all about uh, the fact that he could interpret dreams one of them dies that very day because he was guilty as far as Pharaoh's concern and the other one was promoted and then one day Pharaoh had a dream it was a series of dreams and he had dreams about these fat cows eating everything in sight and then these cows that were scrawny that turned around and ate the fat cows he called all of his sorcerers in because Egypt was full of sorcery he pulled in all of the disciples of Ra the sun god and said tell me what my dream means they couldn't do it and then all of a sudden I think it was the cupbearer says hey king guess what there was this guy back in prison that could tell dreams could could foretell dreams his name's Joseph you might want to call him 20 years later all of a sudden Pharaoh sends for Joseph Joseph then comes to the king he hears the dream and he says I cannot interpret the dream but the God of all heaven can the God of gods can see because even Pharaoh thought he was a God Pharaoh tells him the dream Joseph interprets it and says you're gonna have seven years of great plenty in your harvest see because all of the Egyptians were farmers that's where all the wheat of the world was coming from at that time and by the way Egypt was the hub of the world then he said the only problem is it's going to be followed by seven years of famine and Pharaoh says you know what do you have a plan he said yeah I'm a manager 
He said, I'm putting you in charge. So he took him straight out of prison and put him in charge of all the food in all the land. He would be the equivalent to the king of England's or the queen of England's prime minister. That's what he would be. And so he saves all the food up. And then all of a sudden, here comes the famine. And then everybody starts running out of food. And guess what? So does Joseph's brothers. They start running out of food. There ain't even any food to feed the goats and the sheep. And so they go to Egypt. And when they go to Egypt, they discover that there's this guy there that is very powerful, that's managing the food of the world. And they beg him for food, and he gives it to them. And he recognizes them. He knows those are my brothers. And he has opportunity to get even right then and there. Long story short, he doesn't get even. Before it's all said and done, his younger brother comes there, and his dad comes there, and they all move to Egypt. And what ends up happening is Joseph rescues his whole family and all of the visions that he had of his brothers bowing down to him came true. But what I want you to see in this story is there are 20 years of prison, being rejected, seeing all these visions in his head and none of them coming true. We have such a tendency to ask God for all of the things that are glorious in this world. Yet Joseph never lost heart. Now, I had a friend of mine give me a book. This is the new Max Licato book. God will carry you through. He gave this, this friend of mine gave this to me because of what I'm going through. And I started to read this book, and my gosh, it has blown my socks off of. Mm -hmm. It's been unbelievable. But guess what it starts with? The story of Joseph. He says, I've got several stories I want to write you, uh, write down and show you. And the way he writes it makes you think that he's just writing a story like from somebody's life. Oh no, it's Joseph, it's Abraham, it's, he goes down the list of all of these Bible characters, right? So watch this. This is what Max Licato said in this book. This stuck out to me. Joseph didn't see this assault coming. He didn't climb out of bed that morning and think, I'd better dress in padded clothing because this is the day I get tossed into a hole. The attack caught him off guard. So did yours. Joseph's pit came in the form of a cistern. Maybe yours came in the form of a diagnosis. A foster home or a traumatic injury. Joseph was thrown into a hole and despised. And you? Thrown into unemployment line and forgotten? Thrown into a divorce and abandoned into a bed and abused? The pit, a kind of death, waterless and austere. Some people never recover. Life is reduced to one quest. Get out and never be hurt again. Not simply done. Pits have no easy exit. Now, if you know anything about what I do for a living as a pastor, is I help people out of pits. That's what I do. And you know, I've run across many people who will not even let you into their first layer of personage <laughs> because they're so afraid of falling into a pit again. And so they will not allow anybody in. And what they don't realize is that they've sealed their fate. If they're a Christian, they're not ever going to do anything for Jesus. They're stuck. If they're not a Christian, they probably won't ever ask Jesus to be their Savior. Because they're afraid of anything. Especially this God who allowed this to happen. You know, I have a lot of people 
that I minister to honestly are mad at God. God let them down. What they don't see is, is God was trying to work on their heart. They had pride issues. They had other issues. He was trying to work on their heart. And he couldn't do it because of their pride. And so he allowed the devil to do something that would deal with their pride. And when their pride got hurt, they just withdrew into a cocoon and never did anything. In fact, they're in survival mode. I meet them all the time. But watch this. Joseph's story got worse before it got better. Abandonment led to enslavement, entrapment, and finally imprisonment. He was sucker punched, sold out, mistreated. People made promises only to break them, offered gifts only to take them. If hurt were a swampland, then Joseph was sentenced to life of hard labor in the Everglades. I thought, what a picture, right? Yet, he never gave up. Bitterness never staked its claim. Anger never metastasized into hatred. His heart never hardened. His resolve never vanished. He not only survived, he thrived. He ascended like a helium balloon. <laughs> An Egyptian official promoted him to chief servant. The prison warden placed Joseph over the inmates. And Pharaoh, the highest ruler on the planet, shoulder-tapped Joseph to serve as his prime minister. By the end of his life, Joseph was the second most powerful man of his generation. It is not a coincidence to state that he saved the life of the world from starvation. How did he flourish in the midst of tragedy? We don't have to speculate. Some 20 years later, the roles were reversed. Joseph, the strong one, and his brothers, the weak ones, they came to him in dread. They feared he would settle the score and throw them into a pit of his own making. But Joseph didn't. And in his explanation, we find his inspiration. Now, this is a quote from Genesis 50, 20. And this is the NAS although it says it as good as the NLT does. This is Joseph talking to his brothers. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. In order to bring about this present result, to preserve many people alive. In God's hands, intended evil became eventual good. Guys, one of the things that's going on in my life right now, many of you have seen the Caring Bridge thing, and you know that this cancer thing is all cleaned up in my one area, but now it's showed up in my liver. And... When you hear the word liver, it scares everybody to death because I have these things that's fascinating. The, all, of your, all of your organs have these complicated names to them, right? But your liver <laughs> is not complicated. Without your liver, you die. You either live with a liver or you die without a liver. And so when something starts attacking your liver, you go, wait a minute, this is not good. It gets your attention. Well, let me tell you something. I have people trying to understand how I can keep my resolve through all of this. I'm going to tell you two things God has taught me in the last two weeks. You have two things that cause you to be able to persevere anything. Attitude and perspective. Those two things. One of those comes from God. For you to get a true perspective of what's going on in your life, it has to come from God. He's the only one who could turn the light bulb on to something that you're going through and go, what is this? What am I supposed to do with this? That was my first question when I found out all this. God, what am I supposed to do with this? He gave me perspective. He says, what are you doing now? I said, 
living? He goes, then live. Live. I'm not promised a tomorrow. Have you realized that none of us are promised a tomorrow? Yet we Americans live like we're going to all live to be 95. You know how many people in my family live to be 95? One. Out of five generations, one made it to 94. Why do we have that perspective? It's a wrong perspective. We're not going to live that long. One out of five generations of my family made it that long. And by the way, he smoked and drank his whole life. Outlived three doctors. <laughs> so it's not about being healthy. It's not about, you know what I think it was? I think he obeyed his parents. Because that's in Proverbs. If you obey your parents, you'll live a long and happy life. <laughs> I think he obeyed his parents even though he drank and smoked his whole life. And you go, okay, I see what you're saying. So what does that mean for the rest of us? We're going to die sometime before 94. So why, what are we afraid of? We're not promised it tomorrow, right? Well, the other thing you can control or is within your control is your attitude. Do you know one of the things I have learned in going to the oncology department and Michelle has seen me at my worst when I started this next treatment I've had two treatments now when I started this second one I cried and I told her I don't want to be here and she said I know but she said Jim God's got purpose and do you know what? Once again, the encourager, guess what I've done in the oncology department? Every time I go in there, there's somebody in there getting their first treatment. I walk up to them just like I'm the clown in the room. I build them up. I encourage them. I pray with them. They look at me and I go, oh, by the way, I got one of those too. I'm not just the clown. And they go, well, what's different about you? Well, I have a relationship with Jesus, and he calls the shots. You know what? Cancer is not going to kill me. God has determined the length of my days. So God ultimately controls that. Cancer is not going to kill me. Bad health is not going to kill me. God is going to say, Jim, you did what I asked you to do. Well done, good and faithful servant. Today's the day you go home. That's what kills me. And when we begin to look at life like that, then we truly live. We truly live. Many of you pray for my healing constantly. I want to be healed just like you want me to be healed. I have had faith enough to be healed and for whatever reason it hasn't happened, it doesn't mean it's not going to happen. But what I know is God is good all the time. And he has a plan for me. And in that plan, it happens to be that I'm supposed to pastor some people in the oncology department. I'm supposed to build some nurses up who sometimes see their patient on their last day. I'm supposed to look at a doctor in the eye and tell him, you know what, I appreciate everything you're doing, but God ultimately is in control. Because doctors need to hear that. And then there's days like Thursday where the Macedonian princess, that's what I call her, there was a foreign exchange student who came here to Ardmore and went to school, liked it so much, she went home and said, I'm moving to Ardmore. So she went back to Macedonia, packed up her bags and moved back to Ardmore, went to college at Murray State. And she lives here now and works at Mercy Hospital. And I call her the Macedonian princess. Because she just has this thing about her. She is joyous every day. And when she walks in the room, everybody comes up. And I'm like, I love her, right? 
I get to encourage her. I hug her every time I go in there because I appreciate what she does. You know, what I've learned in my life is there's not many encouragers. That's one of the spiritual gifts that there are very few of. And most encouragers are never encouraged by another encourager because there's only one usually in a group. Isn't that crazy? I had a guy that came here to church for, I think he was here for two months. And last Sunday, he came up to me, he said, Brother, I love that sermon. I love the way you preach. I love the way you do life. I love that in this cancer battle, you look me in the eye every week and encourage me. He says, my gift is encouragement too, and I'm going home to encourage. And I want you to know I love you and you mean something to me. God sent me one. <laughs> right? There are others in you that have that gift too. But sometimes the encourager needs to be encouraged. Amen. So guys, I want you to be thinking about these things. I also want you to be thinking about the fact that there were Christian people that died in the Congo from Ebola. There were Christian people in Uganda that died from HIV. When there are widespread pandemics, good people die. People who are living for the Lord die. It does not mean that I'm going to die in this. Please continue to pray for my healing. At the same time, pray that I will truly live with all of my heart for God Almighty. That's what matters. That's what matters. Michelle and I have had a lot of hard conversations in the last couple of weeks. But you know what? God is so good. I'm better insured now than I've been in my entire life. Not only that, God's got a plan. And this is not a farewell. I want you to understand I ain't quitting nothing because I don't know how to quit. What it is is perspective. I want you to see perspective. This church is here because I had a vision. Another man had a vision. We came together and that man helped it happen. And then one day he handed it off to me on a day that he didn't know was coming. And I'm going to hand it off to some guys who actually know it's coming, which is awesome. But not just yet. The time is not right. I think Robert would be proud. I just know that these guys have done everything I've asked them to do. These guys are sold out, just like I'm sold out. They know exactly who they are in Christ, and they're willing to do whatever it takes. And on some levels, one of the reasons I'm going through all of this is to show them what good suffering looks like. Because if our, if our world, America, does not turn around soon, there's going to be hell to pay soon, and it's going to be bad. And we've got to be able to persevere through that. We've got to be able to live for Jesus in the middle of that. And so we've got to be prepared. Guys, I love you. I don't want any of you leaving here saddened for me. If anything, you pray for my strength. Because here's the deal. I'm going to live until Jesus calls me home. Whether that's two years from now or 20 years from now. By the way, I'm going to end with this. <clears throat> People pray for miracles all the time. I should have been aborted. My parents should have never got married. And I should have been aborted. Because my mom lost everything 
if she didn't marry my dad, she would have lost everything, family and everything. In 1959, that's a big deal. I got hit in the head with a golf club when I was 11. Should have killed me. I was in a car wreck when I was 15. Should have killed me. I had an OD when I was 19. Should have killed me. Had my legs almost pinched off at the knees when I was 27. I should be in a wheelchair. I've been, I've confronted people doing bad things in multiple situations and all they could have, all they would have had to do is slit my throat or stab me and it had been done every time God protected me. I go back through my life and I look at the miracles of five and six and seven times that I should have been dead. Yet here I sit. God has been good. God has rescued me. God has saved my soul and God has used me to speak to people throughout my whole adult life about Jesus. That's what matters. Be thinking about these things as you go throughout your day. Continue to pray for me and pray especially for Michelle. But guys, I love serving you and I love loving you. And God ain't through.